Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll start. I think there will still be people joining and, you know, I know what Zoom's like, so you might have to keep going in and out and things like that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start and yeah, I hopefully we still get a few more people joining, but I'm sure they'll get filled in as we go. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone and good evening for tonight, or I suppose afternoon or morning, depending where you are. I saw a few different countries pop up in the RSVP list, which is really, really good. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, this is our second Broadgate Search social webinar. Um, so we usually host really great events in person where everyone can you know, grab a drink and have a live panel discussion, considering the current circumstances, webinars are now the next best thing. But still, you know, feel free to have a drink in hand and kind of sit back and enjoy. Um, if you haven't come across us before, we'll get search for a governance and finance specialist recruitment agency. And we've got offices in London, Manchester, Dublin, and um, operating with a global reach. And um, so the reason we aim to host these kind of events um, and webinars is to just engage with our network and really discuss topics that are, you know, interesting and relevant and current. Um, my name's Perrin, um, I'll be chairing tonight, and I'm a recruitment consultant at Broadgate. I work in the interim and sort of project market within accountancy and finance into insurance and financial services. Um, so tonight we're going to be discussing the hurdles faced by IFRS 17, which um, obviously is ongoing and complex regulation, and it's creates a pretty complex program for insurers. And so our aim is to basically share tips um, and lessons learned from people who have been through and are still going through this. Um, and uh, just to kind of help people make the best decisions throughout, it's, this is obviously a regulation that still, because it's ongoing, nobody really knows everything about it. So I think these kind of webinars are just good to share thoughts really. Um, I'm excited to be joined by an expert panel tonight who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but first, as you're joining, you should be able to see some poll questions. There should be four poll questions um, that you're asked to answer as we start to help the panelists direct their answers in you know, the best way um, and add as much value as possible. And there will also be three closing poll questions, um, which will be uh, just after the discussion. And um, so you can select there from multiple choice um, on the polls. Um, we'll have the panel discussion tonight for about an hour and then go to Q&A for 15 minutes or so um, and then a separate link for a virtual networking room will be posted in the chat. I think Lucy's already posted it. It is also on the meetup page and she'll repost again um, and that will be for half an hour afterwards. Um, if you've got any questions along the way, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat box um, and then we will answer them at the end or you can wait to the end and then post them there. Um, we, if we don't get a chance to answer all of them today, we will be doing a white paper write-up and you know, we can answer them then. And also, just so everyone's aware, we're recording at the moment and we're going to upload the final footage onto our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I suppose now sort of enough for me to go over to the panel. Um, so I'll go to, as an introduction, you guys can all sort of say hi, I'll go to Justin first. Hi Perrin, thanks very much. Uh, thank you Broadgate for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first ever live webinar, so bear with me. Um, as you can tell from my accent, uh, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I'm a Chartered Accountant and a Programme Manager. Um, I've spent the last two years working um, on an IFRS 17 program uh, in a Lloyd's Market Special Lines Insurer. Uh, and really I'm here today just to give you um, my experiences and, and advice and more stories from, uh, from how that went. Um, so you're very welcome. Amazing. Um, and next we'll go a bit of an introduction from Pranav. Sure. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Pranab. Uh, really excited to be here uh, and talk about IFRS 17, uh, which could be a dry topic sometimes, you know, so we'll try and add a bit of humor and uh, experience, personal experiences uh, to it. Um, I come from a big four consultancy background uh, and have been consulting uh, independently as well, um, which 
took me to a number of companies which uh, were facing the similar kind of challenges around IFRS 17. Worked with Justin as well in a couple of those and uh, has been a really exciting journey um, to help clients overcome those challenges. Um, and here we are, you know, just to share that knowledge really um, and help out anybody else who's going through a similar process. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then Susanna, come to you. Yeah. Um, let's make sure I'm not on mute. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the webinar. So, yes, this is my first one of these that I've done as well. So, I think it's quite interesting to be able to share um, our experiences as well. So, at the moment, I'm working um, with an end client, Aegon, up in Edinburgh. And we're in that sort of the final hurdle, I think you would say, getting across the line to have the solution complete. So uh, my involvement in that is I'm also um, a qualified accountant and a program manager. Uh, so I think there's been an awful lot of experience gained with that, which hopefully we can share and answer some questions from the uh, audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rahul. Hi, uh, Fal. Thank you, Farid, for inviting me to this uh, uh, this forum. Uh, I, uh, I look after the uh, methodology and uh, technical work stream uh, at uh, uh, my current client, uh, which is uh, Just Group. Um, I mainly bring in the actuarial flavor to the world of accountancy. Uh, that's my job, really. And then making sure that whatever, uh, uh, whichever way IFR 17 is being implemented, uh, what would be the consequences of, uh, uh, you know, of any implementation um, in terms of design of the methodology or the algorithms that we are bringing on board uh, in terms of what would be the financial impact of it and then uh, how this would evolve in future so um so i get involved in all work streams from design architecture to methodology to technical aspects um, and then i've been doing this since i think very beginning of uh, ifr 17 i think this in december uh, 17 something uh, that's when i started off Prior to this, I was uh, involved in things like ALM, uh, solvency to internal model and uh, other areas. So, yeah, it's quite exciting, really. So it's like Pranab said, it might be a bit dry, but I think it is It is very exciting, really. It gives me a freedom to use all the mathematics which you can bring it on board. So yeah, I bring the geek aspect of it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> and um, last but not least, Martin. So afternoon all, uh, very nice to kind of join you. I'm hoping you'll only see me here from my office, but there is a small chance that my 10 year old and seven year old may just do oh, everything they're supposed to do this evening and barge in to give you a weather report has happened on the other day on the phone or any of those kind of things that can happen on these live, live situations. Um, so I'm from Togetic. Uh, many of you will know us. We are specialists in terms of corporate performance and regulatory reporting. So we have uh, a good couple of hundred Solvency 2 customers and a very wide reach across the insurance sector. And I'm hopefully going to share some of the some of the world of transformation linked to IFRS 17 and some of the work we've done with now a growing list of large 17 projects. So. Um, looking forward to the Q&A too. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, and thank you all of you guys for putting up with me emailing you all the time and, <laughs> and also just for joining. It's really, really helpful. And I think a lot of questions will be answered. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's really all of it. You guys have introduced yourself. So I'm going to start now with the, yeah, the webinar. So um, Suzanne, I'm gonna to come to you first. Um, so you've got a lot of project and program management experience um, and now a lot within IFRS 17. So could you sort of kick us off by just outlining, you know, the key sort of variables within an IFRS 17 program? Yes, I think because this is quite new, I think it's very important um, to sort of get all these key things down, first of all, before you sort of embark down a certain route. Um, so very much is the scope. So in terms of the scope, we'd be looking and understanding which products are in scope um, as part of IFRS 17. And there might be some things that are impacted also by IFRS 9, which is in the case that the composite insurer that I'm um, working with at the moment. So it's very important to understand that. 
and then I think in terms of a strategy so a strategy is to look at you know how how far do you want to go with this do you want to do compliance compliance plus or do you want to go further than that to make it almost into a full sort of transformational piece of work so um, that's something for to be considered it's also then looking at the systems are you looking to utilize what you've got on the stack already introduce some new toolkit or just rip up and start again so you know there's lots of different things to sort of consider there and understand the capabilities within that current landscape um, again stakeholders you know this is very much impacting the actuarial and finance areas um, within potentially a project team as well as a BAU area so I think that's important to get that buy-in at the start because this is going to be quite a long journey it's going to be quite far reaching and involve quite a lot of people so to get those people on board at the beginning and make sure they're fully engaged i think is really important um thinking about the structure how, how do you structure this i think a lot of people have structured it in a similar way which we'll probably touch on but it's just to make sure you've got a structure in place uh that will bring together the sort of the modeling requirements the methodologies and the sort of reporting those are probably the key aspects then a schedule a plan even if it's a high level plan what do you intend to do do you want to look at this in terms of doing a sort of dry or parallel run before this goes live hopefully the date doesn't get pushed out again um, but you know still with the, the, the current assumption of uh, 2023 do you want to have a period of dry run parallel run <coughs> sorry that's the dog barking there um, <laughs> and um you know what would that look like so working backwards from the, the 2023 date how long do you want to give yourself to undertake that and then yeah then it's just really to get started i think that's probably the thing to start you know don't underestimate the magnitude of this there's an awful lot to be considered um which we're also probably going to touch on here i think so it's definitely to sort of get started as soon as you can mobilizing it in the right way considering the things i've just mentioned yeah, amazing. It's good to hear it broken down and make it sound so simple. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. <laughs> so, I mean, back to you, Suzanne, again. Um, I hope the dog doesn't mind. I hope we're not <laughs> being too loud for him. I think um, he was delivering something. <laughs> it's okay. I think he's, I think he's not in favour of a parallel run. Uh, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I suppose our first question for you um, mm -hmm. was, what has been the best way to set up work streams to ensure delivery and manage interrelation and dependencies? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I've worked on a couple of IFRS 17 um, programmes. Um, so one that didn't quite get going and then one that obviously were underway nearly at the end and over that final hurdle. They seem to be structured in a similar way. So you've got kind of a, a methodology sort of work stream which is looking at the standard look at that interpretation of that and then saying okay how do we make that practical application of what the standard requires to then um, be put into practice and, and work on the products that are in scope for that particular client so that's kind of one area then probably next along you've probably got then a calc some modeling which predominantly where the sort of um, actuarial um, engine would sit whether it's a profit uh, moses um, Towers Watson sort of stack that would probably sit in there and the changes that need to Martin did I mention the right ones there um, you know where those would uh, would sit and then you've got kind of the end state then where you've got your sort of consolidation and reporting so where this then comes to then translate all of the new requirements in terms of the CSM and and the way that those things are presented and actually how those items are then disclosed and that's using a potentially accounting rules engine um, you know to get it as a kind of an end product as well which we use at the client that I am as well so yeah it, I think those three streams seem to fit quite well together because it sort of puts the individual components but then it helps you manage those interrelationships and dependencies yeah perfect thank you Suzanne and so somebody's put in the chat here the dog seems to be upset at the thought of another extension <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want that. <laughs> uh, um, perfect. So, yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, obviously, you mentioned the actuarial uh, side, so I'm going to go to the actuary next. Um, so, really helpful points. Um, and following on from Suzanne, um, Rahul, what do you think the strategic impacts of IFRS 17 are? Um, what areas and how may they be impacted? 
Right. I think uh, uh, there are lots of areas I think uh, that I can see being uh, affected uh, from strategy point of view. Um, uh, I mean, we have to keep in mind that you know the IFRS 17 uh, is not uh, a prescription, really. You know, so it you know unlike solvency two. So in solvency two, you were pretty much told, especially for standard formula, for instance, you did have some flexibility on internal model, but you are pretty much you pretty much know what you need to do. Whereas in case of IFRS 17, rather than being prescription, it is a principles-based approach. So the IESB has drafted a list of things and left it to the insurers to figure things out, uh, how they actually interpret that, and they develop their own uh, methodology around it, and then they try and implement that. That can have a number of consequences. So I think the biggest uh, thing from strategy point of view you need to think about is that whichever company you are working in, you know, what type of company it is, you know, is it a closed book company? So the likes of Phoenix, for instance, and, or and many others, maybe I should not take names here. So I think you know, if, if you are a closed company versus if you are open to new business and you're selling a lot of new business, uh, whether your products are, have front ending of profits or they have back ending of profits, whether you're selling annuities and whatnot. What I'm trying to say is, is, is we are bringing in a new animal called CSM in the picture, which didn't exist before in the IFRS forward, which would mean that when you implement IFRS 17, your accounting books will need to account for uh, CSM, which has to come at the expense of something. And that something will not will be nothing but whatever PL you have accumulated over a period of time. So that money would be sort of taken out of that PL box and then that'll be put into the CSM box, which means the net equity that you have available. Uh, will go down, you know, so that suddenly goes down. So in a way, you're trying to recycle your profits. And that can have a number of consequences again. So, you know, first thing is like, you know, what would be your tax position? So you have, suppose you have front ending uh, profit products, like so if you have pensions book, if you have annuity book, you have already declared, declared lots of profits to your p &L, um, in the past. And suddenly you're like, okay, no, 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 we want to uh, uh, say, okay, we have not declared these profits in the past. Uh, we are going to declare them in the future, but you've already paid tax on it. So HMRC will come into play here. And then how you actually negotiate, uh, not negotiate, I think, how do you actually lobby to HMRC in terms of getting some transition benefit in the future? How you can actually do that? That's something you need to think about. You also need to think about whether you want to have high net equity position or do you want to have higher CSM? because one has to come at the expense of the other. So some companies might think having higher CSM is a good thing because it gives a message to the markets that okay, we are very profitable. But at the same time, it, it can be viewed by investors and analysts that, okay, this company has too much money locked into CSM, which means they cannot do a lot of you know, new product launches, for example, uh, because they don't have a lot of uh, uh, free equity uh, lying around. So this can again lead to things like uh, what sort of dividends a company can declare. So, you know, because if you have lots of free equity around, then you can actually, you know, perhaps declare more dividends versus if you have all the money logged into the CSM, then that is something you cannot really, you know, uh, give money to your shareholders. Again, another contentious one is like, you know, the remuneration of the directors, uh, the people who are working in different companies at board levels and all that is usually linked to the amount of profit uh, uh, a company is actually declaring, uh, has been declaring so far. Although there might be some workarounds here, you could do go into alternate profit measures and all. But I think that is something that will be taken into account. Further, you could have things like mergers and acquisitions. So M&A activity would be taken, you know, taking note of this as well. I know that reinsurance industry is really looking at it, trying to develop some solutions that can actually uh, help insurers in terms of uh, what impact it would have. Uh, new product launches is another one. So what sort of products would be sold in the market? Things companies would need to look at all the products from IFR 17 lens. So something that looked very nice for it, I'll give an example here. So for example, DB products, DB deferred products. And this is, I know, being discussed across the industry given what ISB has. ISB has been, you know, really asked a lot of questions on how we can actually declare profits on deferred DB. In deferred DB, we used to declare a lot of profit on IFR on under IFRS forward, the day on which it was acquired. Okay. But now suddenly, if there's a deferment period of 20 years or 10 years, then this would, this may, I won't say this can mean, but this may mean that you cannot disclose a lot of profit uh, for the next 10 years or so, or 15 years or so. So is that a bad product now from IFR 17 view? So 
shareholders will be watching this markets will be watching this and i'm pretty sure that companies will be thinking about it as well so i think lots of these are the areas i think and i can go on we can give you 10 more line you know uh, areas about this that uh, uh, but <laughs> the time is limited but in each of these areas whatever methods you are developing whatever systems you are developing they should be developed uh, by keeping in mind uh, what lies three years from now two years from now five years from now but i think market is still uh, or industry as such is still in the early stages and as time goes by uh, you will see this thing developing further and um, i think auditors big four companies um, have a big role to play here uh, because they can actually and sessions like this uh, would be helpful as well to understand how others are viewing this problem and if they have you know, you know uh, that's sort of a common understanding across the industry so yeah loads of them i can go on and on no thank you i think we're getting a few questions and stuff coming through as well because you know topics to talk about and things that we're going to talk about throughout now with it within the webinar and um, so yeah thank you Rahul. and uh i'm going to move on now to sort of more methodology um these are two terms that i hear a lot from project managers and program managers and um, so i'm going to come to justin and hannah sort of at the same time because i know you guys have worked together previously on ifrs 17 projects um, and i'm going to aim at both of you um, if you don't mind so and the question is, which delivery approach do you think is better for IFRS 17 programs, waterfall or agile? Lead, a leading question. Um, <laughs> I think probably the conclusion is it's a bit of a combination. Um, I think certainly for data and systems, um, particularly with IFRS 17 where the, you know, the requirements aren't crystal clear, it's not possible for the, for the actuaries and accountants to give detailed requirements, so waterfall doesn't really work. Um, as, as much as we might like to, to stick with that approach because uh, it's familiar, um, it'll be too slow. Um, and, and in this kind of a, in a compliance program, you, you can't wait to the end and get a bad surprise. You, you, you have to have certainty along the way. So Agile is useful as a methodology, um, and that's because it, it recognizes that the solution's evolving, that you don't know everything up front. So therefore, there's not much point spending months and months and months and hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars trying to work out the requirements. Um, you're better to take a slice of the solution or your best guess uh, and, and work with it. Um, so I think definitely for data and systems, Agile uh, works well. And also in light of sometimes, you know, the vendors, if you're buying a TCM calculation engine, the vendor won't give you a final data model. You know, they're still developing it themselves. So you haven't, you've got a moving target. Um, so I think Agile works in that sense. But the, the caveat is um, Agile itself uh, is a cultural change. So if the organisation isn't mature in Agile, um, or maybe only one of the divisions has, has become agile, and usually it's the IT department. Um, you know, if, the, if the supply side is talking agile and approaching things in an agile way, but the demand side, the customers, um, are still talking waterfall, you're gonna have a, a conflict. And so there's, there's really a, an assessment to take <laughs> at, at the beginning and try and decide if um, agile is the right way to go for data and systems, um, then really there might be an education piece and there may be a need for um, agile coaches to come in and just help everyone understand what the roles are, make sure everyone's clear on what the approach is. Um, Pranav, you might want to add to that from your, your experience of going through transitions from waterfall to agile as well. Yeah, sure. We, we, we call it the agile method, uh, which is basically a hybrid of uh, the waterfall and the agile. Um, but but yeah, I, I totally agree with Justin. I think um, uh, in both clients who build their own uh, calculation engine as well as clients who prefer to do a buy decision, and bring in a third party. Um, a combination of those methods has worked really well. Um, so there were some components, uh, like Rahul mentioned earlier, you know, where uh, there was an early need to identify uh, which products, which geographies, uh, what kind of HR impacts uh, in terms of uh, recognition of profit and uh, and bonuses, etc., have to be had on people's um, uh, day jobs. And that needed to be brought up up front, um, but it was not closely tied to delivering a IT project as such. So that, that uh, you know, and that still needed a structure, a work stream, you know, uh, leads and so on. Uh, and and what helped was really to uh, create like a program tom, so to speak, uh, because this is a long-standing program. Um, you know, instead of having an end state tom. Uh, we, we then went on to set up a program, Tom, 
of, of which uh, some of these work streams uh, help answer some of those early value questions around uh, which products, which geographies, which um, uh, books are going to be most impacted. Um, but then also help bring together some of the mainstream program delivery aspects under those work streams. And then once those work streams were created, underneath that we were able to apply uh, the agile mindset, um, if not the methodology, to essentially expedite uh, and trickle feed information into those work streams and bring out value as we got more and more clarity in terms of technical decisions, in terms of uh, a maturing uh, product market, um, in terms of vendor tool sets, or just internal expertise. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it's probably, the right answer is probably a combination of both. Um, um, but this is also a great uh, time to essentially introduce some innovation and transformational change, which, is, which lasts beyond the regulation. And uh, here I mention, uh, here I'm referring to the uh, agile mindset. Um, you know, in, in, in a number of clients we worked with, um, that, that appeared to be an upfront challenge uh, to convince, um, you know, uh, the workforce that um, ambiguity was okay. And, and that we won't have all the answers on day one. And it's okay to make those mistakes. Um, so I think, uh, that, uh, you know, a combination of these methods helps to kind of gently introduce these principles uh, within the organization. And then once the regulatory program is finished, you still have all that workforce who, has not, who have now worked on um, uh, Agile and have adopted that methodology to be released back into uh, BAU. Uh, Perrin, you are on mute, I think. Oh, I've done the schoolboy error of Zoom. Uh -huh. I should you know better that I'm speaking on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you both of you for, for answering. Um, I'm going to come back to Suzanne now again. Um, and in relation to the schedule, which is obviously something you mentioned at the beginning, Suzanne. Um, what method have you chosen and how long would you expect to run before start along with a dry run or, or parallel run? Okay, so um, I've been working with the current end client for nearly two years now and um, my particular sort of reporting work stream um, started off with a waterfall more traditional method because we wanted to wait to understand methodology and positioning papers and to understand the impacts of those. I think everybody's nodding in agreement there because I think we're probably all in the same boat. Um, and I think then as we've gone through then, we had to requisition um, an accounting rules engine. Again, that was another tranche of activity that lended well to a waterfall approach. But then now, as we've actually gone in to build, we're looking at the sort of different components that we need to do. We've actually now transitioned to a, an agile approach because we're actually doing small components of work that is like ingesting um, the CSM results from profit. You know, looking at how we then do our reporting to group. And then we've got other things as well that we've, we've done in the solution that are probably more localised. We've looked at sort of expense allocations and things as well. So we've actually got those just work packages and then sort of uh, running that in a more agile method. And I think that also helps in terms of um, running POCs because this is so new and so different. You know, it's this has been a change over sort of a 20 year period. And I think to actually demonstrate and do proof of concepts for people to start to understand and come on, come on the journey because it is such a paradigm shift. I think that's what we've done and said, here's a POC, we'll show you the concept of this, what it would potentially do. And then once that's gone through kind of that first iteration, we then upscale that and then that's actually becoming part of the end-to-end -end solution. So yeah, it's very much using that agile methodology. Oh, so I think you're still on mute. Did you want me to talk about how long as well um, did we set aside to um, to do the dry run? So, um, yeah, we've set an ambition uh, to have a dry run um, sort of starting now. That was always our original timeline. This this program has never stalled or sort of stopped. We've kept the momentum going. So we're looking to go into a dry run process um, at the end of June and then um, just look to keep going so that we're kind of ready then by. Um, sort of early 2022 so it's then using it ahead of that to start with that transition fully to the new standards 
Yeah, it seems like you're quite ahead of the game, which is which is good. And it's good to hear that you guys maybe got similar methodologies there in the way that you've you work things out and so that hopefully is helpful to everyone um, just for everyone on the call um, I mentioned the polls at the beginning of uh, this call but we're actually going to I think my colleague Lucy is going to put them up now and um, it's just four questions and um, so yeah here we go you can um, you can vote I mean vote but it's really just answering some questions to help us make sure that uh, we're, uh, we're giving the right answers and trying to kind of tailor it a bit to whoever's on this call and where you are in your stage of the programme. Um, so hopefully that helps. But yeah, that would be great if you guys could just pick from uh, multiple choice that's popped up and that sort of best describes your situation. Um, so yeah, thank you if you could do that. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to move away a bit from methodology now and um, onto optimization. So Rahul, we'll come back to you. Right. Um, obviously with your experience, uh, the question that we've got was what opportunities may insurers have for an optimized implementation? I think when I say optimization, um, I think I mean, um, it's very much from the methodology angle as well. And when I say methodology, I don't mean uh, technology. I don't mean uh, data issues. I don't mean uh, tech, um, you know what software solution or something. So what I mean is, uh, what do you want your uh, systems to do? What algorithms, for example, you want to implement? You know what what mathematics, for instance, you you want to bring in there. So I think. Like I think for the two, what I was saying earlier that it is, there's going to be a lot of impact on your books, um, and what's happening is that uh, senior members, uh, like you know CFOs and board of directors and all, they are you know uh, it's a lot of I think they need they need to be educated I guess as well, and they are sort of picking it up uh, now as time goes by. So when you as a consultant on any such project, you need to make a list of things uh, uh, for each area that how something can be achieved, different ways of doing things. Uh, like I said, this is not a prescription. This is uh, standard has asked you to do something and so long as it meets certain criteria, it should be okay. So there might be 10 different ways of doing one thing. So in terms of where the opportunity areas are, I think uh, uh, you need to think about whatever method you are implementing what would be what would be the impact on the for example the release of profits in future at what rate money would be released from the csm and that would really depend on for example things like what financial risk adjustment you are applying uh, i know everybody has is aware of you know top down bottom up approach and all the rest of it uh, and what reference asset portfolios you're using but Within, I think the deeper question is, uh, uh, you know, how you're applying that financial risk adjustment. So there are many ways, for instance, uh, one opportunity here can be whether you want to use historical default assessments, you want to benchmark it to some sort of credit default swaps, you want to use some uh, structural approach like, uh, you know, EDF based models or some complex uh, 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 mathematical formulas, or you could use some credit indices like synthetic indices like uh, 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 iTrax or uh, CDX, depending upon how easy it is for you to implement it, which part of the world you're in. But all of these things are going to have an impact on how uh, the uh, you know uh, the money can be released into the books. And again, it goes back to how the markets will be perceiving your book. So that's one area to look at. Um, I think one biggest area, which is the immediate one in future, is the transitions. So we have transitions as the first thing, really. And then at that point in time, when the transition transition hits the companies. At that point, companies have a straight choice between the two, you know, so, so long as you cannot do fully retrospective, companies have a choice between either they can go modified retrospective or they can go, you know, fair value approach. This is a very important area and I think something that is not to be missed because all of these will give you different answers. And of course, there's a varying degree of how complex fair value is or versus how complex uh, you know, modified retro is. My view on this is that um, uh, technically, uh, not technology, technically fair value can be very complicated, it can be very subjective, but it gives you a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility, so long as your auditors are happy with it. Whereas modified retro and fully retro are very data intensive. There is a, you know, there's a set pattern and there's a list of our six or seven items that 
uh, IAS gets destroyed, that how something can be done. This is one opportunity area that is not to be missed. Depending upon, I go back to that, depending upon what is your objective, do you view CSM as a good thing or do you view CSM as not such a good thing? Or you would rather have more free equity in there. So you need to be very careful about one, where do you draw the split between uh, uh, which years or which cohorts you want to do fully retro versus uh, not fully, sorry, not fully, fully retro is not a choice. So you have to do it if you can. Uh, but between a modified retrospective versus a uh, fair value approach. And once you have decided that, then how do you want to implement that? Because it will straight away affect your uh, uh, you know, bottom line of the books you're putting in there. To put that in context, for example, in the uh, when you're de de deciding what discount rates you want to use, and if you are in a company that has something called PVO1 of uh, 10 million, which means like, you know, if the discount rates move by one basis point, then your books get affected by 10 million. Even if 20 basis impact, which is very easy, it's not a big number, 20 basis, you know, uh, is affected by which method or which route you're choosing, that is gonna impact your books by 200 million pounds, which then become, translates into very big things. So how do you get around it? Make a list of all the things. And when I go to uh, board members to present uh, uh, different proposals, so I'll tell them, okay, these are the ways uh, that something can be done. These are the pros and cons, how complex something is, cost and benefit analysis of it. And this is the potential impact if you do it, go down one way versus the other, how that would actually look like. And you need to make sure that board of directors, chief actuaries, or whoever is there, you know, or CFOs, they actually understand it completely so that the decisions can be made, which can then be filtered onto systems team and you can ask your developers uh, to do, you know, what you want them. So I think these are some, again, uh, there's 50 other areas I can talk about, yeah. but these are just the ones. And I think another one I should mention, but I think it is a few years. I think it's not there yet. I think it will be there in two, three years, I suppose, because the market is still developing. I think there's a big opportunity here for reinsurers, reinsurance companies. I think they can develop some solutions and I believe it will come about in a few years time. Uh, I can't discuss those here, but I think there, there, there are certain things, uh, uh, ways that can actually assist uh, 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 different insurance companies. But let's see how that develops, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. Really appreciate that. And um, we're, we're getting a few, we're getting answers on the poll, which is really good. Um, so one of the points that Suzanne made at the beginning when sort of outlining the variables is, was scope. I know Pranab touched on this um, briefly. And one of the poll questions that we asked was, um, how would you describe the scope or ambition of your, your project? It looks pretty even on the answers. So 40% um, said compliance plus, and then both 30% are just, just compliance and another 30% are sort of full transformation to align actuarial and finance areas. And um, so that's quite interesting. It's actually pretty even. Um, so I'm gonna to come to you next, Pranab, um, as a strategy specialist. Um, so the question we've got around this is what are the organizing organizational impacts of IFRS 17. Um, oh. oh, sorry. And how do we approach IFRS 17 when it has such a large scope? Um, so compliance only strategy or to wider business change? Sure. Um, I think, um, you know, so, some of the organizational aspects around uh, the products um, and the balance sheet uh, have been touched upon already by Rahul. So I'll, I'll not repeat those, but um, he's absolutely right. I think, um, uh, um, much beyond the program delivery, uh, you know, there are impacts on which geographies we operate in, what products we offer to the customers, and then how do we uh, record the profits for those aspects uh, within our books. But, you know, if, if we just come back to the program aspects um, uh, to a certain extent, um, I think, um, you know, an, an, uh, what my personal observation has been that there are various pockets uh, of business areas which are dealing with almost a cottage industry of uh, regulatory reporting. Uh, you've got solvency too, you've got uh, IFRS 9, um, uh, you've got gap reporting, sometimes you've got US gap, local gap and so on. So uh, I think in my personal opinion, the uh, uh, IFRS 17 aspect uh, loaded on top just uh, builds up enough momentum to then start thinking about a, a, a center for regulatory response, which is a consolidated uh, view or a body that essentially within your organization 
uh, that has uh, some line of sight from the CFO so that um, you know you get that senior stakeholder buy-in, but also acts as a hub to bring along all the capability, the expertise, uh, the mapping of processes and controls, assigning some ownership to it. Uh, more importantly, the data, you know, uh, managing and controlling the data uh, that then helps us to make uh, crucial decisions around uh, evolving some of these um, uh, decisions beyond the regulatory aspects, uh, but also fulfills the regulatory mandate uh, in terms of building and delivering these reports. Um, and I think it, it, it's something that, uh, you know, organizations can now think of, you know, if, especially like in Suzanne's case, you know, if uh, they've gone through a fair period of the program delivery uh, and now already into the dry run, you know, start looking beyond that regulation and see how can it deliver a lasting benefit until the next IFRS 17 comes along. And then, you know, we repeat the same uh, learning pathways and the struggles again. Um, so yes, it's the center, uh, you know, thinking about a consolidated hub around, you know, a center for regulatory response would be kind of uh, one of the key things I would consider. Uh, but then there are other aspects like, um, you know, if you look at processes and controls um, as a result of responding to various regulations one by one uh, and each within a gap uh, of a certain years. So then, you know, every time you restart a program, essentially some of that previous expertise is lost and you start all over again. So uh, you, you get a set of processes and controls that have been mapped uh, very specific to uh, each regulation. And then, uh, you know, it's uh, segregated between departments. Uh, I know a guy who knows something and, and that kind of uh, mindset. Um, and, and there isn't, you know, every time we looked at it, basically the processes were not there, it was not mapped. And they're not uh, pointing to a uh, um, enterprise-wide process model where I could point that thing in a board and say, you know, that's where my heat map is, that's where my most exposure is. Um, and I think it's a good opportunity to then start mapping those out and standardizing some of those aspects into an enterprise process model, uh, even at a high level, um, so that you are able to quickly understand the impacts of, uh, you know, where you need to focus your attention. Um, it, it ties into governance and communications. Um, a, lot, a lot of the points that Rahul touched upon earlier, um, you need to be able to communicate uh, how you are planning to tackle this challenge with the market because it will have an impact on your results, on your annual results, on your balance sheet. You need to be able to apply some internal governance before some of these decisions are made. Um, and, and, and the governance uh, that we came across was fairly localized. You know, it, it, it's not tied into something that looks organization-wide. Um, and, and therefore, I think, uh, you know, setting up um, a communications channel, both internally to the employees and externally to the markets, um, uh, needs to be uh, something that uh, organizations must set up as part of this program cultivate it, uh, en enrich it, and then uh, have it as an ongoing um, you know, state of affairs. Uh, then there are some technical aspects, uh, you know, which, um, which uh, organizations get almost forced into thinking. Uh, and, and two of these things are mainly around data management and infrastructure. Um, so uh, in, in some examples, um, organizations have had to adopt a big data strategy because there is simply the existing estate cannot cope with the volume of data, but uh, all imposed by IFRS 17. So the IFRS 17 program suddenly became a big data program and then it was tied up in circles, you know, trying to resolve something ground up. Big data by itself is a big topic and then, then come on to IFRS 17. Um, and similarly around uh, data management uh, with more and more emphasis on, um, you know, drawing actuaries uh, out from their uh, current roles into front-loading that work with, um, you know, IFRS 17 um, recognitions. Essentially, um, uh, what you have is a, la a lack of capacity within, a, a within um, the actuarial teams to be able to give their time to IFRS 17. Uh, and the way to get around that is, um, advanced analytics or automation uh, or RPA um, to then look at what are the elements of processes, operational processes, BAU processes that you can automate to be able to then uh, get the time uh, from actuaries to be able to focus on IFRS 17. 
uh, you know, if you if you look at annual surveys and uh, of CFOs, if you look at um, uh, even the the survey we just had right now, uh, a lack of capability seems to be a consistent uh, issue. Um, uh, um, people like Rahul will be in high demand, you know, as as things go on. Um, and essentially, you need to be able to backfill some of that uh, BAE work uh, through automation uh, to be able to free up uh, time and, and, and resources. Um, and then finally, it's, uh, you know, it's the elephant in the room, which is around close coordination between accounting and actuarial practices. And this goes down from people, processes, systems, data, et cetera, et cetera, um, to be able to uh, then come together uh, in that CSM calculation process um, and recognition of uh, profits to um, you know um, you know work, work in a more collaborative way. So uh, yeah, yeah, I guess to summarize, you know, the, there are wide ranging organizational impacts, some around products, some around profits, but also around uh, creating centers of excellence, uh, looking at your infrastructure, your uh, data management practices introducing some more rigorous governance and controls that have higher level visibility within your steerco and then optimizing your processes into a um, enterprise wide model that then helps you to identify bottlenecks quickly the next time around perfect thank you Pana. um so yeah i think i mean martin i know this is something that you've been involved with for a long time and can definitely add to the add to Pranab's points. Um, in, in your experience, um, what are your thoughts and um, what types of transformations have you are you seeing off the back of IFRS 17? Yeah, I think this is a is an interesting one from the poll. So where the poll showed that 30% of the scope was pure compliance and then there was the compliance plus and the transformation, which together accounted for a 70% of that, that, that response. In my view, I would group those together as some form of transformation because it's a bit of a hackneyed phrase and sometimes we get a bit of transformation fatigue or we just get transformation thrown at us that's not really transformation. And in my view, IFRS 17, stating the obvious, but it's such a massive project. It has such cross-functional resource that are required to come together, in some cases, for the very first time. Yeah. And it has a future. So what I mean by that is that the standard itself will change. And you probably have one of the most senior stakeholders you'll ever have on a project telling you or expecting you to hit that deadline very, very comfortably. So in, from my perspective, whilst we'll look at this as a I have to do this because someone's making me do it and a purist compliance view. The reality is that it must deliver much more than just the compliance with that external request. It must do. And I think that as we've, from the experience that we've had at Togetic, we're across the board, there are lots of flavors of it. And to Pranav's point, the resources are short. Some of those resources are very transient. That in itself, creates the need for a change that will, be, will outlast those people. So I think that it's also kind of important to consider that this is part of a wider trend. So in most finance teams, and this would be true also for the actuarials, they've all undergone massive change. They've all been under the pressure to produce much richer and more agile views of data, not just for IFRS 17. And so I think IFRS 17 can't live alone as a, a compliance only function. It has to operate in that modern world where the CFO expects a lot of you, expects a lot of your data and is getting hungrier for that data and is also expecting that compliance will add some value. They are not expecting for every insurer to simply comply and get no competitive edge from this, from this project. So I think, and just kind of the experience that we've seen, I think that in some cases, we've seen people say compliance will pay for your transformation. There is budget that is protected. It may not be a lot, may not be as much as you want, but it will give you the attention and focus and probably a dedicated team. And so some, as they did with Solvency 2, will use that sensibly and will try to drive some more value from it. In other cases, and just kind of finishing on maybe a couple of almost practical hints, I'm not sure if they're too practical, but just to kind of uh, some guidance. We've seen companies that have simply used this just to pause. 
and they've said, okay, taking a bit of a step back, we know we're gonna have problems with people and with data, and they've drawn up a very simple systems landscape that their company currently operates in, because they are gonna draw data from all over the place, and they wanna say, okay, these are the systems we run, and that's the big eye opener. They see some old legacy systems, they see obviously a bit of Excel sticky tape, they see probably four or five different systems across solvency, across consolidation, which this will impact, across their planning that this will impact, and probably different ways of retrieving data. And at that point, their CFO will say, I want more than compliance. And we'll hope that you can rationalize some of those data sources and do more than compliance. So my, my, my sort of last thoughts are, I think that a review of the systems landscape and duplication of effort and systems is just a very good starting point. I think that take on the transformation agenda, not because you want to disrupt the whole organization, but because the project is very important. And as you're involved in the project, there is a huge opportunity for the people involved in the project to make a real impact on the business. So I'll pause there because there's, there's other things to chat about too. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I'm actually going to come right back to you anyway. Um, another question that we asked in the poll was, what solution strategy are you following? Um, and just looking at it now, 15% yeah. have said in-house build, 40% by purpose-built solution, and 45% under review. Um, so my question to you, Martin, um, with all this in mind, and I suppose considering that people are at different stages in the programme or potentially reconsidering, you know, buy versus build, um, can you share your thoughts on the two options and the maturity of the market? Yes, so um, I guess I should just first of all declare a probably enormous bias here. <laughs> I've, worked, <laughs> I've worked in finance software for my whole career, for over 20 years in various guises with finance, providing software of some kind that helps along with a lot of expertise and consulting effort to bring to bridge the gap between the current processes. I would there personally fall definitely on the, on the, on the buy option and not least because kind of coming back, this is, a, this is a huge project and you have enough to tackle just in getting your resources to focus on the internal change, let alone the actual calculation engine and the production of the journals and whether that product or whatever you build can last beyond the first change that when the standards go under another change post January the 1st, 2022. So I think that where you look at kind of the obvious, I think in terms of a build, you've got the resource, you've got risk, you've got future proofing that. And whilst you might get something quite tailored, it is a very short term view. And I think it's one that will create problems. Um, there probably aren't many people in the room. I think we have about 60 people in the room that have been involved in a, arrived at a company and said, oh, thank goodness they did an in-house build on that, that project. Let's use that system. They, will, they, they have their shelf life. And I think what we really should be targeting here is very strong engagement from the, the team. That's what we need. We need their brains and their knowledge of the process and their knowledge of the business. We need that. But I think it's, I think it's a, a challenging path to look at build. Now on the flip side, buy is by no means uh, you know, a perfect route. And I think in that instance, what you have to do is make sure that your buy means buy. So you can sometimes buy something and actually means you're almost building it and you're almost creating this thing from scratch because it's pure vaporware or because you've seen a few um, slick P uh, demos or there's been something that isn't, has not lived up to its promise or the people you worked with are not available for when you need them. So I think, again, it's stressing the basics. I think Pranav and Suzanne kind of taught me through that preparation, that due diligence, and that kind of just common sense to work this through a POC, to understand your, the, the current state of your project and the ability of your team. But this is gonna be a global project for many of you, and even on the small projects, there will be enough to contend with. And I think your, your focus should really be on making sure you buy well, not whether you should buy or build. Think back to what you really need and make demands of your provider. You know, you should be able to see the POC, you should be able to see the journals, you should be able to see the full transparency from a report right through to the source and all the manipulations along the way. 
and there's no harm in asking for that. And you're still thinking, well, maybe I'll build it and I've got a very strong IT function. Include them too. What is to be lost if you were to sort of sit them alongside your other options to make sure that you get the solution that fits the company? And that's where I would kind of, the kind of approach that I'd take. I think I'll just add something to uh, what uh, Martin just said, really. So I think uh, uh, you're at Tegetic, right, Martin, you said? That's right, yeah. So I think, see, they, now I have seen some of your solutions in the past. Uh, and, 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 and then, uh, see, the, the challenge with IFR 17 is uh, that, you know, again, I'll try to draw a comparison with Solvency 2. So I, I, I remember a few years ago uh, now, um, seeing one of your solutions for QRT population. So, you know, in Solvency 2, you have QRT templates, which needs to be populated and submitted to you know, for regulatory purposes. The good thing about, or the neat thing about that was, you knew exactly which template it is. You know, it is, it is a standardized template. So that gives the opportunity for vendors or for like Tegetic or all the other software providers to actually develop something that can be standardized and sold and implemented across any insurance company that they need to. Whereas, problem here in IFR 17 is there is nothing standardized. You know, so, and I have seen uh, quite a few uh, uh, presentations, but at times, you know, from different vendors, but uh, you end up feeling, you know, uh, the whole IFR 17 working group is sitting and we're just watching this thing and like, oh, this doesn't work for us. You know, so I think what companies can do, so I think just a couple of, you know, two, a couple of few, two or three suggestions here that uh, you have a limited budget to work with. It doesn't matter which company you're working in. Okay. And uh, you still have a long way to go. Okay. So, First thing companies can do is try and identify, try to keep things as simple as possible. Don't try to overcomplicate things uh, in terms of methodologies, algorithms, and whatnot. Try to identify what systems you have already have available. For instance, if you're talking about risk adjustment and diversification benefit, you have some sort of diversification engine already in your company. If you're an internal model company, you must have things like uh, risk agility, for instance, or you would have algorithmics, or you would have dice from Deloitte or something else, you know, some sort of you know, engine would already be there. Think about, think creatively, how you can use those simulation engines using different types of copulas and whatnot. How can you actually use that in IFR 17 well, for risk adjustment purposes? Try and tailor that. You can, there are ways to do it. That will save you a lot of cost as well. Similar thing can be done for any. So you have loads of systems anyways already available. See how can you keep how can you keep things simple and how you can actually leverage the existing systems. Straight away, I think once you have developed some uh, some idea about how you want to which method or which route you want to go by, whether it is top down, bottom up, or some, some examples of or some mathematical examples I was giving earlier. Engage with your one. Of, I, I presume that most of the insurance companies are working with uh, one of the big four firms or big you know, consulting firms like likes of EWC, Deloitte, EY, and KPMG and whatnot. Either as an advisor uh, capacity or as an auditor, engage with them early. I doubt that there would be any auditor who would be happy to sign off on methodology right now, but at least they, you can go to them and say, "Okay, fine, guys, this is what we think how we want to do things." At least in principle, does it make sense to you? Do you have any serious objections to it? If not, at least you can go and develop you know, things in that direction. That'll save you a lot of money rather than trying to invest too much time, too much budget, pumping things into developing software, trying to do things yourself. Um, so engage with your advisors, uh, big four firms, and uh, with your auditors early, and at least get approval in principle uh, if they are not happy to sign off, and, you know, which I doubt they will be, uh, at least at this stage in time. And then, of course, keeping your board, you know, uh, 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 you know, in the loop as well. That okay, these are the decisions you have taken related to um, any aspect, be it discount rates, be it risk adjustment, be CS and calculation, what the templates are going to look like, and what the impact on your balance sheet would be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they should understand uh, what the impact would be. So, a cost of benefit, cost and benefit analysis can be done. But as I said, keep things simple and try to leverage as much as possible and, and engage early. That might help in the long run. I'm just I'm just conscious of time but I definitely think this is the kind of thing that we'll need to put in you know in the networking room as well which we, Lucy should be uh, putting a link in now um, but yeah I think it's good I want this to be a discussion anyway but just so we keep kind of on track of time the last question which you did actually kind of just touch on Rahul there about having the board members and everything in the room I feel like we have to go 
you know, have to talk about the current climate at the moment and, you know, with coronavirus and working from home and everything that's going on. So, Justin, we're going to come back to you. Um, left you there for ages. I haven't asked you a question in ages. I'm still away. I'm still away. <laughs> I can, I can so be brief. <laughs> in light of the deadline extension and the current, you know, pandemic, um, how do you react and remain, you know, proactive on an IFRS 17 programme and you know, keeping everyone engaged? Look, it's, it's a really good question, uh, and it's one we've all, we've all had to deal with um, recently. Um, I, I think really it's a, it's a bit of a pros and cons analysis. Um, the, the, op the options really are you, you keep going anyway, um, and you try and get the thing done and shut it down, hand it over to BAU, and then practice for a year, um, or you, you slow down and you reallocate the resource, um, or you pause. Um, if you haven't started, now is probably the time to start, um, but, but that's kind of what the, the sponsors and the steering groups and all the SMEs and the external parties and your auditors are all looking, you know, which way are you going to jump? What are you going to do? Um, and, and there are pros and cons and plays between risk and cost and everything else that goes with it. But I, I think really that, that my, my um, position would be just t take a chance, take a breath, <laughs> just take stock of where you are. Um, you, you knew based on the original date um, how likely it was you were going to make it or not, what risks you were facing. Um, and I think you've probably got an opportunity now to revisit those. And it's things like revisiting the standard. Um, you know, the, the actuaries and the accountants sort of made all sorts of um, informed uh, interpretations, stroke guesses on what the regulation means, how it might apply to the business. Hopefully, they uh, had a go at modelling an opening balance sheet. Um, but that was probably done a while ago. You know, quite a lot's changed. And, and the standard should be finalised this month. And so there's a good opportunity just to revisit those technical papers and those interpretations. Um, and probably also uh, get some independent uh, advice, um, not necessarily your external uh, auditor because they won't give you an independent view, but another professional services firm could um, give you a view of whether you have interpreted it like everyone else has in your industry or whether you're an outlier. Um, and that's useful to know because, you know, to you it might make obvious, might be obvious, but if when you publish you're an outlier, you've done something completely different and that's, that's tricky. <laughs> and you may or may not, depending on how confident you're feeling, um, also start engaging your external auditor and just get their, get their view, formally or informally. Um, because the last thing you want is to go through all this pain and process only to find they won't sign off <laughs> when, when, the, when the moment comes. Yeah. So I think it's probably a good opportunity just to take stock and just make sure you're still going down the, the most appropriate path. Um, I think in relation to, to COVID, uh, I think empathy is probably the key thing. Look, people are under a lot of pressure. No, no one's been in this situation before. The, the schools are shut. Uh, people are worried, you know, they're stressed. They, they haven't got the same interaction they've had. And, We've, we seem to globally have got out of uh, the fear and loathing and panic, um, but we're kind of in a bit of a holding pattern. Um, yes, working from home works, um, but no one's quite sure whether this is the new, the new normal or whether there's something else. Um, you know, will there be a second wave? Will, will all this disruption happen again in a short period of time? So I, I think with the change of the um, compliance date uh, and COVID, then empathy is key. Just, and really that's communication internally and externally. Keep everyone aware of what's going on. Um, and make sure that, that, you know, that people are okay and treated like people in the first instance because you don't want them burning out, you don't want them leaving, you don't want them sitting there being anxious and worrying what might be happening. So it's kind of just being clear on what direction the program's taking, what the sponsor wants and, and where we're going. Um, I think it's also a, probably a good point for a lot of programs to look at that buy versus build decision, as, as Martin said. You know, the, the decision was probably taken a while ago um, and it might have been that, you know, even though you're an insurer, you thought your IT department was, was pretty amazing and would be great at doing some regulatory compliance software, uh, and maybe over the passage of time, you realise that might not be such a, such a the, the best decision. And in addition, last time you looked at the third-party um, black boxes, you know, tools off the shelf, you know, that, that, they may not have been fully developed. So when you did your proof of concept or your RFPs or RFIs, you might have been a bit disappointed. Um, you may have equally realised that your data wasn't ready either, so you couldn't, you couldn't start a big implementation. Yeah, but the market's moved a long way. Um, and so it's definitely worth, uh, as Martin was saying, do a couple of, do a few short proof of concepts. You'll, you'll probably now have the data, so you can provide the data files and see what the outcome looks like. And, and that will just help either validate um, your decision or might provide a, a, a different direction. Um, I think probably lastly, it's worth um, just making sure that uh, the, the internal and external stakeholders are aware of what you're doing and, and why you're doing it and where you've got to. Um, whether you're pausing, um, whether you're going regardless, um, I think it's just important. Everybody will want to know. Yeah, everyone will know the regulations changed. Everyone knows we've lost time because of COVID, but no one knows what you're doing about it. So I think it, it's really key to have a consistent, regular message um, to everyone involved so they know what's happening and, and why. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and let, uh, let the questions begin. 
Thank you so much, Justin. Yeah, um, I mean, that kind of wraps it all up. We did have a question that we were going to put, you know, we discussed when we um, all kind of met up last week on Zoom. Um, we had a question we were going to kind of put to the audience, which we thought for network, for the networking room is a good question to have. And it was, what do you think the conversation will be once we're 18 months past the deadline? So that's something for people to mull over to hopefully discuss. Um, we've had quite a few questions um, in the Q&A and Suzanne, thank you so much. You've answered quite a few of them. So we're going, we'll be able to go to the ones um, that haven't, that haven't been answered. My colleague sent them to me on my phone, so it's like not just texting randomly and <laughs> the questions. Um, Lucy will also put up a last poll, which is just a kind of closing poll, which you can also click on, uh, on leaving um, in a minute. Um, so yeah, I suppose I'll go to the first um, question here. Um, how do you explain to your CFO his shopping list is too big for the budget, i.e. the cost challenge with these huge programmes versus quality? Um, I think I suppose that's a, I'll go to Suzanne maybe for that. Uh, yes, I was just reading the panel questions. Uh, yes, so I think, yeah, I think what you have to do, I think it goes back to what we said at the start. I think it's understanding that scope and your strategy. And I think going along then to say, you know, if we are going to go and requisition um, a solution, that you're really clear what that costs and you've done your homework to have all of that laid out. I think that's really important. You know, run an RFP process. I think I had a couple of questions on that from people. You know, that's what we did. We, we had a, a, a sort of a, an initial sort of um, kind of beauty parade or whatever you want to call it, you know, where people came along and sort of showed what they could do. We then whittled that down to three, that then went to two, and then we got the final one that we actually went with in the end. And I think that was a really important process to do before you actually then commit and understand what that spend will be. Um, because then you can say, this is the scope, this is what we want to do, this is how we want to potentially use um, existing toolkit. I think we've also mentioned that as well, that, you know, the capabilities there with a lot of the sort of actuarial modelling tools to do this as well, and how well would a potential new solution integrate with um, a new um, package. So yeah, I think, I think that's what you need to do. You need to have that strategy very, very clear about what you want to do, and then start to have a high-level plan to say, how long will this take? potentially how much resource you would you would require whether it needs external specialism whether you can utilize in-house so it's getting all of that costing together in one nice package to take forward and say oh, this is what i believe is is what we would need to spend to get this in place and then it's saying here's then the benefit which i think we've also touched on that here to say here's the benefits that you would also start to see from this which you can't always uh, quantify but i think it's you know thinking about replacing of kind of offline spreadsheets you know, it's it's looking at how you can um, examine MI differently. It's, you know, streamlining working day timetable and acceleration. You know, it's all of those things there. I think that that you can't necessarily put a price on, but are definitely benefits to be called out. Thank you. I hope that's helped to, uh, whoever, whoever asked that question. Um, we've got quite a few more. So um, obviously, guys, as well on the panel, if you have extra comments or you know you want to jump in please do um, another question we've got which is quite a simple one but might be more difficult to answer how long does the impl implementation typically take um, Martin do you want to do you want to go for that one as someone that's yeah I, th I guess there's <clears throat> probably it's that famous famous joke about it depends where you start from doesn't it uh, but uh, the the question around I guess a typical project I think we would we would expect you to kind of commit to a year. Let's think this this project. There's bits of this project. If you're very prepared, you could nail in six, seven, eight months. I I've no question. But I think you have to going back to what Justin said. You have to also appreciate you're still trying to win the support of your wider team. You're still trying to keep them working very very remotely. And I think that the actual project itself, when you look at get into the depths of it like parallel runs and dry runs there's a long tail to this project so i think that actually it's healthy to think of this as a year to 18 months and back to that question about the ambition and scope of the project and how far you should go i i think it's about cutting your cloth you know you've got to make sure that you can manage this project with the resource you've got with the pressures you've got with the budgets you've got and i think you can 
you can uh, define that project so it is a very healthy one year but you can i i think you have to be wary of the of the six plus months beyond that and again coming right back to what i said a minute ago it's about preparation get just just, just talk through how prepared you are and and i you know just have a very very candid conversation you need to have that timeline conversation very early you need to really feel confident in your plan going right back to what suzanne said at the very beginning so i think that's a, probably a bit of a a fluffy answer but it, it, it i think you need to have a conversation probably beyond beyond zoom <laughs> <laughs> no i appreciate that um and, and the next one we've got is um do you see a benefit in restructuring over the phases of the program and if so how would you shift to delivery um justin do you, can we go to you on that one your thoughts? Oh, I'm, I, sorry, I missed the second part of it, but I, I think the question was, uh, does there benefit in restructuring the program as it, as it develops through phases? Um, so yes, yeah. I think my answer. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's really needed. Um, mm -hmm. I think that as my experience was, um, we started with the Hilson Aurora and then we slowed down quite quickly, realizing that actually the data <laughs> wasn't uh, ready and that was going to take a long time um, for the discovery, the remediation and the quality uh, at the same time as, as having sort of patchy requirements uh, in terms of, of interpretations and how they were made. Um, so it was sort of data and systems heavy, if you like, uh, because we were kind of in a position where we knew the requirements weren't 100% clear, uh, but we knew we needed to find, we knew the, we knew where the likely sources of data, but we knew the likely types of data we'd need, but they had to go and spend time finding it, and then time finding out what kind of state it was in, building a landing area, getting it into one place, testing it, all of that could happen um, regardless of the actual CSM calculation. We knew that needed to happen anyway. Uh, and that's what we had um, the most certainty over, and that was the most likely no regrets activity. Um, so you need people who understand data, data architects, data governance, stewards, owners, all that good stuff. Um, whereas you can leave the SMEs, accounts and actuaries, to try and interpret and grapple with the standard. Um, so, and so that, for that phase of the program, uh, yes, we had a, a methodology forum, we called like a technical oversight group, where everyone debated uh, and tried to interpret the standards. Um, but we had the majority of the program were um, data analysts, business analysts, um, developers, trying to get the data from where it was to where it needed to be and then work out how to transform it to ETL it into a, into a tool. Um, so for that phase of the program, you needed one set of skills. And then as you transition through, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different set. You focus more on operational readiness, uh, the processes and the controls, and those voices need to be at the table. Um, and it's important that, that if, if you can, even, even though it's difficult, to have the voices at the table that, that are the people that are going to inherit the process in BAU. There's not much point having um, external people or contracts or consultants uh, making those priority calls. Really, the, the product owner or the person BAU who's going to inherit it has the most skin in the game. <laughs> They'll be the most interested uh, in what you're doing and will give you the clearest direction. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question we've got here, which I suppose could go to all of you, really, if we basically might have to give a very quick answer, but biggest challenge you've faced so far? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think definitely, um, I think it's data. I think data is so key to this and the granularity of the data because the standard requires you to not only think about granularity for all the different facets of this, but I think about that lineage as well. That um, I always look at things kind of on a right to left basis where we see here is the reporting requirement. How do we get right back to those policy admin systems to get that and understand the flow through? Um, that has been the most complex and challenging piece in terms of understanding the data. Uh, you know, a lot of things at the moment are taken offline and remediated. I think Justin had alluded to that as well. But you don't want that. You want to have a pass through of information so you can see that flow clearly going into the actuarial system, coming then into the finance ledger and finally going out into our group reporting tool. You have to see that lineage and the, the standard does make mention of that. I think some pe people have been so bogged down in understanding and interpreting that, that they've maybe lost that sight as well, that you have to have that lineage and that understanding to be able to drill back right back right, but to the start to understand where these transactions have derived from. I'd, um, I'd, I'd support that. I think your data has certainly been a, um, a heartbreak and a, and a headache. Uh, I think the challenge is, is from the senior stakeholders, you know, that they'd, they'd like to see um, a CSM. 
<laughs> and that's difficult to do unless you've actually remediated all the data and all the problems to get something that's that's credible and, and reasonable. And so there's a there's always a debate between should we remediate all the problems we find um, and get the calculation perfect, or should we give an indicative early view of what that might look like and then remediate later? Um, but I think yeah, all all the, the biggest roadblocks and the longest time and the and the biggest cost um, does seem to be around data, and that's also impacted by you know whether you choose um, if if you're going to buy a, a third party system and it's a black box, you know it, it will it will do what it needs to do, but it just has to be provided with all the right data in the right format at the right time. And so the onus then is on the on the client or the organisation to be able to do that, uh, and that's quite a big ask. And, and that's that's uh, I think probably if there was a common theme, that's underestimated in terms of IFRS 17, just how difficult and complicated that is. <laughs> uh, and then you get into scope because you find all the problems everyone suffered with for a very long time and would like IFRS 17 to fix on the way, uh, but there isn't time to do that. And, and so that's the that's the rub. So I think it, it probably is data. There's many problems, but data is probably the biggest one. If you haven't solved that, you haven't got a calculation. I think, uh, uh, you know, from my point of view, I think uh, a close, uh, not, well, not a close second, I guess, uh, considering the amount of resources it takes to resolve data issues. But uh, uh, another key one is, um, you know, a constant um, a deliberation around the buy versus build decision. Uh, and, and this is uh, mainly because the timelines keep extending. You know, there, there is always that scope of going back onto decisions that have been made previously, um, say around a buy decision or a build decision. And sometimes rightly so, but uh, sometimes uh, there are just other motivations for doing it and essentially derail some of the program's priorities, um, you know, especially in larger organizations to bring in an external tool set, um, even through the procurement process can itself be a long, long winded uh, process. And, and by the time you have actually started having any meaningful conversations, you've already lost, you know, a couple of months time. Um, likewise, in, in smaller organizations, you quickly go on to a buy decision because there isn't just enough capacity or capability to build a tool internally. But then as, as the program goes through uh, the challenges around integrating uh, that tool onto the landscape, um, where some you know assumptions have been made that once we buy a tool, uh, all our problems are going to be resolved pretty quickly. And, and then, you know, as you face those challenges around, you still got to do your data preparation, you still got to look at your infrastructure, you still got to decide whether it's cloud or on-premise, you still got to train up your people to manage and maintain that and so on and so on. Um, you know, there's that back and forth around, okay, maybe we should go back into looking at build options or maybe we should go back into the market looking at buy options. So I think, uh, you know, what Suzanne and Justin were saying earlier that upfront, wherever we have done that analysis, uh, to have um, you know a very cohesive debate and a very comprehensive debate around that topic uh, helps because then you can point back to this, those those decisions and say, look, we had been through this and we have considered all these factors and for those reasons we made that choice. And rightly so, if if those dis, uh, those assumptions have changed, then you know let's look at it again. But otherwise, you know we should not we should not go back and forth into that process. Yeah, so just to add 2P to the whole whole bunch, I think that fundamentally 17 is a data project. That that is, I think that's an un, unescapable fact, inescapable fact. But it also is worth kind of underlining that if that team is really committed to the project and you've got the focus and support of the executives, then that makes enormous difference. We're working on a project at the moment where the team are very engaged. It's never going to be without its own little challenges, but their engagement makes a huge difference to the project. And it's a bit cliched to talk about just attitude and engagement, but if anybody's run a big project, I think that's the thing you really want to overcome the problems that you will face. So I would say that on the data, think of that both as the challenge you've got to solve, but also that's kind of where the beauty of this thing is, if there is one, in that if we can pull that data, and if we can rationalize some of the periphery systems and if we can get some more interesting insights from this data beyond compliance, then that's where the value of the, of the um, standard will be and the value that you, if you're involved in the project, will be able to stand up and say, we didn't know this, look what we know now. We didn't have access to that data. We didn't have that data before. We were never nearly as ambitious. 
because it can be done. It is now possible that more data can be handled more quickly and you can get to that data. It doesn't mean it's easy, but we can now be much more kind of ambitious about what we can do with data. Uh, so if you've got the engagement of the team, that's, that's, those two things combined would be, would be what I'd ask for in a project. Perfect. Thank, thank you, guys. Really appreciate that. And thank you, everyone that asked questions. Suzanne, thank you for manning the Q&A box as well there. You've answered a lot of the questions. And thank you for that. Um, if we haven't answered your question, we will be doing a white paper afterwards. So we'll get, try and get them all answered. Um, also, as Lucy's been posting in the chat box, there should be a link for our next. We'll do, we'll do a networking bit for, for a bit now and um, we'll keep it to sort of 20 minutes but it's just a chance to say hi to some of the attendees and, and stuff like that um, again guys just thank you so much for for joining thank you so much to the panel really really appreciate it and um, i hope everyone's taken something away and yeah this has helped um, there yeah we'll, we'll do more in the networking now maybe grab a drink um, I'm going to follow that link <laughs> or not, um, but yeah, I'll follow that link. Um, I'll be in one of the rooms, but yeah, thank you again, everybody. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll try maybe and do another one of these if this has been useful to people. We'll, we'll obviously get feedback. Um, but yeah, thank you again. Thanks to all the panellists. Thank you. Thanks, guys.